All right, hello everyone. My name is Mohan Artemi and I will be your instructor in this course, one of the instructors. And in this recording, I'm going to cover the topics that uh, in lecture six, which are uh, the remaining of chapter five. And uh, I hope that you will use this recording to review the chapter before you come to the class okay so what i will do is um, go over the slides and then um, every now and then i switch to some drawings to illustrate the concepts okay so we'll start by going <coughs> here are the slides uh, which you have copy of so we're going to cover section 5.2 um, we talked last time just to put things uh, or link things together we talked last time about signal encoding right so why do we need signal encoding so if we have binary sequence zeros ones zeros ones right? a combination of zeros and ones uh, we could simply, as the picture shows, I could simply represent one by one signal level, 5 volt, for example. The other one is by another, 0 or minus 5, right? And that would be uh, the end of it. But we saw uh, that actually this is not sufficient, um, or this is not always a good idea. Why? Because we don't have any idea what the actual sequence of bits are we could end up with the sequence of all ones which means that the whole signal will be be represented by one voltage level and that corresponds to dc and we saw or we talked about some media does not like dc right? so it, it, we need a different frequency to pass through that medium uh, another problem with this kind of encoding uh, is that sometimes we lose synchronization so what I mean by that is uh, from the receiver side what happened in the receiver side the receiver will try to sample the signal at a specific location right? so where my cursor is so maybe in the middle of the signal here I'll sample the receiver sample the signal if it's zero then it will understand that this represents the zero value uh, if it sees 5 volt where my cursor is right now it will think this is one and so on that would be perfect if the source and destination the so the receiver and the transmitter are in total sync but that we cannot assume that in general because at some point the receiver and the transmitter may be out of sync what does out of sync means means that i may the receiver may at some point sample the signal twice within the same um, within the same period of one bit Let's take a look at this where I'm pointing my cursor here, right? So let's say instead of sampling exactly in the middle, which reads one and then zero and then zero, I may get the two um, ends so out of sync that the receiver will sample the signal twice in one period so one at close to the start of the period and the other one close to the end of this bit period that means that the receiver will read two ones instead of just one 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 right so we need to change the encoding so that we include some kind of synchronization we saw in some cases, like Manchester encoding, that we embed a signal or embed, em embed a clock within the encoding itself. Another type of encoding we saw is sometimes rather than rely on sampling 
in the middle of the like the ones and the zeros the middle of the bit period we make sure that the the representation of the one and zero is a transition rather than a level right? transitions are easier to recognize uh, than uh, levels as i said in a when i represent a signal by a voltage level i have to make sure that the uh, receiver samples in the middle of that level but if it's a transition if it goes from zero to one then this i can design a circuit to say hey every time there is a transition from zero to one that's a one every time it's transition from one to zero it's a zero or the other way around it doesn't matter as long as we are, we are agreeing right. so that uh, solves problems so I don't have to wait for or synchronize the synchronization problem becomes a lot easier right sometimes I combine the embedding of the clock and the transition in one encoding another problem that the encoding try to solve is um, uh, the idea of reversing polarities now when I send a signal like this one and zero right I am actually sending the signal using a wire using two wires one for the ground and one for the voltage level right so the ground represents a zero and the voltage level could be plus five or minus five anyways if somebody reverses the polarity by mistake all the ones become will be read as zeros and all zeros will be read as one to avoid such thing we rely on differential encoding which means that instead of um, relying always on the one being plus five and the zero being zero or minus five uh, now the 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 interpretation has nothing to do with the voltage right so we saw some of the examples like this when we um, when we don't the regardless of how we flip the wires the ones would be always understood as ones and zeros would be understood as zeros so that's a summary of very quickly why we need encoding now okay so encoding will be good to transfer the zeros and ones to voltage levels that can be transmitted over a wire right or a medium in general but we have another issue right so the um, digital signals like the ones and zeros that we see in this slide they don't always go nicely in all kind of medium the medium itself may not be able to uh, we saw in the spectrum again I, rem I remind you of another slide we saw in the previous uh, previous sections every one of these encoding techniques has a specific spectrum and the spectrum is the representation of all the frequency components that go into that or that um, make up that signal make up the signal uh, sometimes I need to change the characteristic of that um, spectrum so that it can fit the medium. All right, so let me show you by example what I mean here. So if I take a look at the frequency, one of the one of the encoding techniques that we saw has a frequency components that spectrum that looks like this or if I look only at the magnitude it looks like this right there is no negative part doesn't matter so here are we focused mostly on the positive side so here we have frequencies that goes from zero to a specific um, uh, frequency the highest frequency components of the signal right if I have a spectrum like this right 
that means that I can pass it through any medium that has the characteristic or has the capability of passing these frequencies from 0 to f of h. Right? Not all medium pass all frequencies. Every medium has specific frequency characteristics. Some medium, for example, act or if we look at medium in general, media in general, they they have a, um, a property that look like a low pass filter or band pass filter, which means that they pass frequencies only within specific range. If I try to pass the signal here through a medium, this hypothetical medium presented in red, if I can, if I try to pass it, right, some of this signal will be cut, so it cannot pass through the medium. Only, only whatever, only whatever frequencies that fall within FL to FH can pass. What everybody, everything else will be attenuated so attenuated, we, you, you heard about attenuation before, right? So any signal will be attenuated um, through the medium, when it goes through the medium. So the attenuation will be so high that most of the signal will be lost. So if I send 101010, um, we, we, what we will receive at the other end will be co totally different. Right? And we will not be able to receive the signal correctly. So one solution to fix this problem is to do modulation. So modulation effectively moves the signal that used to be the, the, the spectrum of the signal is around zero. It can move it so it's around another frequency which is the the carrier of frequency okay so now if i modulate the original signal i change its spectrum and shift it so it becomes gets nicely within this range here and i can pass it this is very important why because most media needs to be um, we need to do this for 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 most media and especially when we look later at uh, frequency uh, frequency division multiplexing where the spectrum let's say the 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 spectrum that we are allowed to use uh, um, whether it's over the air or in in uh, uh, guided media like copper, uh, the spectrum may be divided into ranges, and each range will be used as a channel for one uh, for communication between uh, one pair, right? So my medium can be divided into multiple channels, and each channel will be used to communicate between two. Um, a pair of devices, two devices. Okay? So in that case, if each device will send a sequence of ones and zeros, right, like this, all their spectrum will be within this range. And I cannot do this. I cannot divide the spectrum among multiple pairs. So what I need to do here is to um, take this signal and modulate it with different central frequencies, different carrier frequencies, so that the, the communication between the first pair will use this carrier frequency, the first one, and the spectrum will be within this channel. The second pair will use the second channel with a different carrier frequency, and so on. So I can use this uh, uh, to to pass multiple 
communications between multiple pairs. So that's the idea of uh, modulation. And there are other, other reasons as well. So for example, if I have an analog medium and I want to pass a digital signal, well, I have to convert a digital signal to analog using the, this, this modulation technique. So these are some of the reasons we, we are using modulation. Now let's go back and look at this and say, okay, so the first type of modulation is amplitude shift keying. Right? So the amplitude shift keying is simply multiplying the digital signal by a carrier frequency. If you take a look at this, right, and I'm gonna go back to my picture here of drawing, this is equivalent to, uh, let's say there were, uh, doesn't matter what the sequence is, right? So we have zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, zero. If I multiply it, just simple multiplication, right, with a sinusoidal wave, Right, so what I will end up with is when I multiply zero with the sign here, nothing happens, it's zero. When I multiply the one here with the sine wave, I'll get sine wave zero multiplied by sine, it's zero, and so on. So what we get is amplitude shift king. And now, this signal that I created here in the bottom has a different spectrum. It's actually the same spectrum as the top one, but shifted by the carrier frequency. What is the carrier frequency? Is this frequency here that we see, the sinusoidal wave. This has a specific frequency. It's one over T. The T is the, the, the cycle time, right? So we'll see that the spectrum is shifted by this amount. All right, so um, this is useful. And it's very simple to achieve, but it has certain drawbacks. Um, it's usually insufficient use of bandwidth or inefficient use of bandwidth, right? Um, because we are using one frequency to carry only one piece of information. This will become clearer later when I talk about. Um, different ways of uh, modulation but this one technique is very simple to uh, use for optical communication now in optical communication I can simply use light light is also an electromagnetic um, energy or signal uh, that I can use and I use pulses so a pulse will be representing one, nothing will be representing zero, and the duration of the pulse is the number of ones. So it, it, here the duration is double the other one, so here I have two ones instead of zero. So I can, the receiver can detect the number of ones and the number of zeros this way. Okay, another way of, um, we don't like this zero thing, right? So sometimes this, it's zero and um, frequency, then zero and frequency. Sometimes it's susceptible to errors. And we'll see later. Let's say there is a random noise. So the random noise will, instead of the receiver receiving this nice flat line, it will receive noise. And this could be, if the noise is high enough, could be mixed or interpreted as a, as a, as a frequency as well. 
Um, so in, our, in order to avoid that, we could use two frequencies instead of one. So every time there is a zero, I'll send a frequency. Every time there is one, I'll send another frequency. So I have two signals here, or I have two carrier frequencies instead of one. All right. So how is that um, different? So as I saw here, as we 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 saw here, the original bandwidth of the signal is shifted by the carrier frequency. So if this was the spectrum of the signal centered around zero and this is so the sine wave has a spectrum of one pulse right one pulse only it's not a range like this one but one pulse only if i multiply them like this what i will get is something centered around fc the carrier frequency instead of around zero as before okay now if i use two frequencies instead of one so the zero here represented by one frequency f low and the one is represented by another frequency f high right so the spectrum so now I have this original spectrum and the the two frequencies that I used have two pulses one at FL and the other one at FH now the spectrum will be when the result of multiplying these two frequencies with the ones and zeros will result in something that like this right where it's somewhat widened a little bit and the spectrum is centered not just on around single frequency but actually two frequencies right so that gives us an advantage over the previous one here but also a, a disadvantage the disadvantage is i'm using two frequencies now instead of one the bandwidth is bigger right and the circuitry that allows us to create this is actually uh, more complex. Right? It's not. It's not just a simple multiplication. Now I have to separate the the original ones and zeros into two streams and multiply one stream with the zeros with one frequency and another stream with another frequency and then combine them together. So it's a more more complex than than just simply multiplying the ones and zeros with with sine wave it is less susceptible to amplitude shift keying we call this the amplitude shift keying why because we are changing the amplitude of the carrier so there is a carrier and its amplitude it's either zero or something else right so we are shifting the amplitude of the carrier frequency using the digital frequency here the ones and zeros this is we're not changing the amplitude the amplitude is always constant but we are shifting the frequency and that's why we call it frequency shift keying so we are shifting the frequencies right? but the amplitude is the same so it's better with noise because now the noise what does it do it changes the amplitude Right. Now here, the noise still may affect the signal. Imagine the noise creating these little spikes 
that is added or added to the sinusoid but are but they're not changing the frequencies so we can still recognize the frequencies better so it is less susceptible to errors than the amplitude shift keying so we can use it actually for higher frequency transmissions so the first one maybe it's good for up to 1200 bits per second this one is a bit higher as we can see here when we we consider talking or we consider the one communication channel like between the source and the receiver or the transmitter and the receiver but we always or often we use full duplex communication which means that we need two channels one for the ongoing and one for the incoming traffic and each one of them will occupy bandwidth as you can see here and the bandwidth is centered around two frequencies in this case we need two frequencies for the transmission and two frequencies for the reception right? and we need to make sure that they are distant enough from each other so they don't overlap we'll see the there is a gap in between here right so we have to select in fact four different frequencies to make this happen so it is the frequency shift keying it's a little bit expensive in terms of bandwidth uh, and the use of frequencies all right so there is a better way actually to uh, use avoid the problems of amplitude shift keying without um, without using two two frequencies and this is the uh, phase shift key so the phase shift keying uh, rely on the idea that uh, some circuits can can be designed to detect the shift in the signal so when I send the signal a sign like this we'll call this the the shift is zero because the signal starts now remember sign is the projection the sine wave this one is a projection of a point that rotates around the zero uh, so or, or rotates around the circle right centered at zero here so imagine this point rotating right so when it starts here and if I measure the the y, so the y is zero, it corresponds to amplitude here, and then the circle or that point moves up to here, so that corresponds to the one, if if the radius here is one. And then goes down so that corresponds to this point goes ro rotates more so this point here at the bottom corresponds to this point here and so on it goes back full cycle so it goes back here right so this angle is the phase shift so when the point at the x-axis here y is um, at y is zero so the, the the phase is zero here we'll call that zero phase shift and if the signal starts from the top so it starts from the angle 90 we say that the signal was phase shifted by 90 degrees right and it, if i if it starts from here it's phase shifted by 
180 degrees and so on right so the phase shift and the delay are the same thing so it's here it's like the signal was delayed a little bit so you can look at it it was delayed by this time right you can look at it this way so the signal was delayed by a specific time right so phase shift and delays are are practically the same thing here <clears throat> okay so frequency wise the, the the signal has the same frequency didn't change but the phase changed all right so how can we use this to our advantage let's go back and look at the digital signal again it's one zero zero one zero now instead of changing the frequency itself i'll say i will change the phase of the signal and simply i'll consider a simple example where one is represented by a, a positive voltage and the zero is represented by the negative voltage right so let's see what happened if i have a signal that has one zero one zero right just simple one zero one zero and this corresponds to plus one volt and this one corresponds to minus one volt right and this is the center and i want to multiply it with a signal right sine sine wave so the plus multiplied by a plus will result in a signal same exact sign as before but when i multiply minus with the sign what will happen well everything is flipped All right, multiply it again by positive. Multiply it by negative. Okay. So you see here that this and this part is 180 degrees shifted. The result is the same frequency, but the signal in the negative side the negative that corresponds to the negative uh, voltage level is 180 degrees shifted so as if I'm starting my signal from here instead of from here so I have one signal representing the one and another signal that is representing the zero, right? And that's what we see here. And I, what I did effectively was shifting the signal by 180 degrees. Now the receiver will should be able to detect the phase shift. We can design a receiver that every time the signal all of a sudden changes phase at this point here where I'm pointing, right? So as soon as the signal changes shift, the circuit will detect the change of the frequency of the of the phase. I can use the same technique as we saw in the encoding uh, to avoid the polarity issue. As I said before, if I, if somebody flips the wires, I always need two wires to 
transmit a signal between two devices so if I have a transmitter and a receiver this is the transmission this is the reception and I need two wires and one of them is the ground if somebody flips these wires all the ones so we sent one zero one zero right if somebody flips the wires the receiver will receive things totally flipped so the zeros will be uh, received as ones and vice versa we don't want this right we want to avoid it so we can modify our um, encoding and the modulation so that we have a differential phase shift keying the differential phase shift keying says that <clears throat> If there is no change in phase, it is a zero. If it's a change, if there is a change in phase, then there is one. Right. So here we have um, a change in phase. So that's a one between here and here there is a change in phase so this means that this bit is one and there's another change in phase this means it is another one and here between the one and zero there is no change in phase so this is zero right we'll continue like this if there is a change in phase that's a one if there is no change in phase that's a zero so here by using this concept it doesn't matter if i flip the polarity of or flip the wires i'm still gonna interpret um, the the phase change correctly right. okay so using this concept uh, why do i stop at just one and zero uh, and only two phases I can actually expand this and make good use of it so before I do that let's take a look at what I'm trying to achieve here so let's go back to the drawing and say well if I let's say I have this one and this is zero right one and zero and this will be corresponding to one um, sign one sine wave in one direction in one phase and the other sign the other phase right so 180 degrees shift now each one of these signs carries one bit right? using two phases but I have a circle here and I have a lot of phases that I can use why restrict myself to only one phase two phases here I can use four phases so what does that get me okay so let's say I will use this phase to represent two signals or two bits instead of one so this will this phase will correspond to zero zero right? the opposite phase or 
let's take this one instead it doesn't matter right now which one it so this phase shift correspond to zero one and this phase shift so let's try this one here which is correspond to one zero and finally this phase shift corresponds to one one right so each one of these phase shifts the um, each one of these represent two bits instead of one right compare this to the original here at the top if i continue another let's say doing this using the same time my uh, my drawing are a little bit off but imagine all of them using the same time so within the same time I am actually sending or able to send only four bits here while during the same time period here I'm using I'm, I was able to send eight bits not necessarily in this order I mean I don't have to send zero 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 one one zero uh, it's just the idea that within the same time I can send more bits twice more instead of four bits I can send eight bits right so now I have an advantage I can use the phase shift keying here to send more data within the same time by having multiple phases so here is an example where I use a cosine signal and I shift it by three different ways pi over 4 3 pi over 4 5 over 4 and 7 over 4 so what that mean what does what does that mean it means that, that I took this signal here or this circle and I shifted it I used let me clean it up a little bit instead of using 0 90 I used um, I used pi over 4 and this one this one three angles instead of the original black angles here I use these red angles or red phases right the amplitude is the same for each one and <clears throat> we will call this the quadrature phase shift keying quadrature came from four right and each one of these phase shift represents a different uh, bit sequence two bits to be exact i can expand on the idea and say well why stop at four what if i um, take this and divide it further into eight so i'm gonna use the black ones the black dots or the black phase shifts and the red phase shift so i have this representing zero 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 this represents zero zero one this represents zero one zero which is two in binary so now i used four uh, eight phase shifts and each one of them 
represents three bits so now if I within the same time here I can send not just four not just eight but how many so now I have multiple phase shifts each one of them eight phase shifts and each one of them can carry three bits okay I can expand the idea further and say let's go 16 instead of 8 let's go 32 let's go 64 so instead of just one uh, instead of just two phase shifts or four I can go and take a look at this circle and say well I'm gonna do a lot of phase shifts here and each phase shift will correspond to a different binary well the reality is we cannot do that forever why because we have to consider the nodes right so the more phase shifts become close to each other the easier for the transmitter to confuse them and if there is a noise involved then there could be confusion to the point that the transmitter will not be able to detect which phase is which right but we can do combination of phase shifts and amplitude shift right we can change the amplitude and change the phase so take a look at example like this so if I do something like this so all of these points represent phase shifts and I could have drawn it a little bit better but these are we call these constellations and in this constellation we have 16 different points each point represent a different phase shift and or different amplitude so let me make it clear here so if I draw a line between the center and this dot here this represent one phase shift and represent one amplitude call it r1 here right these two have the same phase shift but different amplitude r2 and r3 this one has a different phase but has the same amplitude as the first one so we have four different amplitudes and three different phase shifts in this constellation again you look at it so these are the same phase but two different amplitudes right and these are um, my drawing is not I should have something that matches or aligned with the center but you will find drawings better in your book you see here these amplitudes are the same but the phase shift is different this has the same phase but the amplitudes are different between these two points so when I look at the the whole constellation I find that there are uh, four different amplitudes and about one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve phase shifts overall and we call that quam which you will see it later Right. so uh, let me see 
so now we get to know something new, right? So, so far we have looked at the bit rate. So how many bits we can send within one second or one unit of time, right? The bit rate. Um, and it was, so far, it was easy uh, to figure out how many signal elements I need per bit. So to explain this point, if I go back to the um, something like, something like this. We saw here that to represent a zero, I need negative voltage or zero voltage. To represent one, I need another voltage. Right, so two voltage levels for two different, for or one voltage level for bit, for each bit, right? So if I have zeros and ones, I need either plus five, minus five, or plus five and zero, or zero and minus five i need just two two levels okay if you fast forward to something like this you'll see that now i have many phases and many amplitudes um, that, you, that are used to send three bits at a time or four bits at a time. So for this constellation here, because I have 16 different points, I can send four bits each. Each bit can be sent by one of these 16 different. So I have 16 different signal levels they vary each one they vary in amplitude and phase and i have four each one of these can be used to send four so now i have to add a new piece of information it's called the pod rate or the modulation rate so i have the bit rate which is the number of bits i can send in a second but then I have also the modulation rate, which is how many signals I need to send per second. Okay. So here, a good example that I saw before. So I, when I said, uh, let's take a look at this time, and I need to send one zero zero zero, right? Three zeros, and one and three zeros. So I have this signal and I have for one and I have this for zero and another one for zero and another one for zero, right? So I have two different signals. Each one of them represent only one bit. So here the number of signal changes per second is the same as the number of bits I need to change per second. Here, if I if I assume that each the these four bits are sent in one second, so four bits per second, the pod rate or the the modulation rate is also four pods for four signals per for, uh, per second. If I look at this part. I see now that I have one, two, three, four signal changes per second, but the bit rate is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight bits per second. So the baud rate is four per second, while the bit rate is eight per second. Let me write this as pod. So now they're not the same anymore. And if I use um, a higher 
constellation higher higher modulation like this the baud rate and the bit rate will be different as well so here we need to introduce these formulas where the data rate will represent it as d here is r oh actually sorry the mod d is the modulation rate or the baud rate and r is as before the data rate so in my example that i just showed you before each signal represent two bits right or each signal represents three bits or each signal represent four bit depends on which quadratic quadrature uh, phase shift keying i use so the the date the modulation rate here is the bit rate divides by how many bits each signal element represent so in my example here i have the bit rate r is 8 bits per second that's just an example it could be different the modulation rate is 8 divided by each signal element represents 2 bits carries 2 bits so the baud rate is 8 divided by 2 is 4 if I use this modulation technique which each one of these carries 4 bits then my baud rate will be the bit rate r divided by 4 right? <clears throat> so the advantage of these techniques is that I can carry more and more bits in my signal without changing the signal that much if I explain it here in a like some simple terms the advantage of this is i can make fewer changes in the signal and these fewer changes will carry more more data fewer changes means less bandwidth right the less changes i make the less bandwidth i consume this is the math behind what we talked about before so um, when we call the quadrature amplitude modulation so now i'm mixing both the phase and the amplitude we'll call that quam and one simple technique to do that is to take the signal which is ones and zeros right and convert it into two streams then take each stream and pass it through or multiply it by the cosine and by the sine one stream i multiplied by cosine and the other stream i multiplied by sine which is the cosine shifted 90 degrees and then add them together so here is the another way to explain it so if i say i have one zero one one uh, zero 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 like any random sequence i don't don't have to choose exactly what it is and so i will convert this to two streams by taking the odd bits the odd number of bits and the even number of bits and separating them so here are 
these are the odd ones and these are the even ones so now I have one one zero zero one one and the other one is zero one zero one uh, zero and I could add something here it's just to make them even right and I multiply this part with a cosine the cosine starts from the top and I multiply this one with a sine so when I multiply these two what I will get I will get a cosine where there is one and zero and something like this and same thing here my drawing may not be accurate but okay. so I get two streams here and then I can add them together so what I will get is quadratic amplitude modulation right so I will get the cosine and then the sine and so on right. okay so we have seen different modulation techniques and i already gave you a hint about which ones are better but we need to compare them in some objective way right so rather than subjectively saying this is better than the other we need to put them all or compare them all using the same criteria so for that we will use these formulas notice that we have in these formulas we have the capital r represents the bit rate and we have the small r represents a filter coefficient the filter coefficient is value between zero and one and we have the bandwidth and as I said before, in just a few, few minutes ago, that we need to make the bandwidth small, right? So bandwidth is actually making the bandwidth small or limited is what we, what we need to achieve. And because the bandwidth is the resource that we don't have. So we need to put as much data within a small bandwidth as possible. All right, so for the amplitude sh uh, shift keying and the phase shift keying, the bandwidth is the same. It doesn't change. Because if you remember, we are using the same frequency. We are shifting the bandwidth. We are shifting the original bandwidth of the signal, the ones and zeros, by a carrier frequency. So we don't really change the bandwidth that much, right? Uh, R could be different between the two of them, but you can see that the R here can go. So the bandwidth can be exactly as the bit rate if R equals zero, or it can be the maximum is between is at twice the bit rate. So the bandwidth for the ASK and the PSK is anywhere between R and two R. For the um, 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 multiple phase shift keying, you can see here that the bandwidth is actually smaller than the, the top two. Why? Because we are taking the first part, which is one plus R, multiplied by capital R here, which is the same as the previous one, 
but dividing it by number of bits per signal element. So if the number of bits is two, right, then the bandwidth for the MPSK is half of the bandwidth of the ASK and the PSK. So obviously the the performance in terms of bandwidth for this one second technique is better right it's half as or less bandwidth for the same rate we didn't change the rate but the bandwidth is half great or we could also look at it from a different perspective and say for the same bandwidth i can send double the data double the bits right so it's either the same rate have the bandwidth or same bandwidth double the rate for frequency shift keying we need the one plus r multiplied by r but we are adding this element here which is twice the difference between the two frequencies we need two frequencies remember for four shifting we need two frequencies so now if i compare this to the ask i need an extra bandwidth to do that and as i said before that's the advan disadvantage of the frequency shift keying is i need more bandwidth now if the the two frequencies that i choose are far apart the uh, difference between them will be big as well so the added bandwidth will be higher if the two frequencies close to each other then the added bandwidth will be less right. finally we have the multi-level fsk so this will be f uh, uh, if you can look at it so it is the same as one plus r but we have the, the number of signal elements divided by the bits so if you compare the last one with the first one you will see that we have multiplied one plus r by a factor that factor could depends on what it is it could make the multi-level fsk better or worse in terms of bandwidth than the original one so number of signal elements let's say number of signal elements is 16 divided by the number of bits per element that's four so 16 divided by 4 is 4. Multiplied by 1 plus r. So that will give us a lot more bandwidth for the same rate. Right? Maybe not a good idea. This is another way of combining all of this slide and putting it in one table and comparing with different r's so with different small r's so with this with r equals zero you can see here that the amplitude shift keying will have uh, this is the number of um, i think it's the number of levels in the signal different m's and different l's when you compare this with the same multi-level phase shift keying with different m's and different l's you'll see sometimes the multi-level phase shift keying is not as good 
Another way of looking at the performance of the modulation schemes is by looking at the bandwidth efficiency. So we'll see how many bits we are sending, how many bits we are sending for the same amount of bandwidth, right? So we are dividing R, the number of bits per second or the bit rate, by the bandwidth. And also, we need to look at the energy per, per bit divided by noise, noise power density. So here, the energy per bit and in naught is the noise power density, right? So we can look at it. So the energy per bit is the signal power divided by the bit rate. So we take the signal power divided by the bit rate, we get how much energy per bit. Right? And we also look at the, en the noise power, which is the noise divided by the bandwidth mix things together we get the signal per noise ratio multiplied by the bandwidth divided by bitrate so now we converted the energy per noise to something that we have seen before, which is the signal to noise ratio multiplied by the ratio bandwidth divided by R. So, here, if we want to reduce the error rate, we need to, well, we need to increase the signal to noise ratio. We need to make this part higher or make the bandwidth higher relative to the rate. So we need to increase the bandwidth or decrease the rate, right? So signal to noise ratio sometimes we cannot increase the bandwidth that much, and we cannot increase the power power is expensive right so in in some cases our choices of changing the signal to noise ratio is not is uh, are limited so what we need we need to do is either use higher bandwidth or less rate for the same bandwidth so that's what the purpose of the, these equations uh, are. So somebody put all of these graphs for us that compares different um, encoding techniques as well as modulation techniques, put them together and put the probability of bit error rate and the energy to the noise ratio, energy per bit to noise ratio. And you can see here that the more I increase the energy per bit to the noise ratio, the less probability I get, the less, the less probability of error, right? It makes, makes sense. Because if I look at it, why it makes sense, let's say I have, this corresponds to one, this corresponds to zero, right? And I'm using plus five volt to represent one and minus five volt to represent zero. Now, if there is noise in the channel, the noise will be added 
but the receiver when the receiver samples despite the noise the receiver will still maybe it won't get exactly 5 volts it will get 5.1 it will get 4.9 it will get maybe 4.5 if, if the noise is so bad but that's also big difference between maybe it will get 5.3 or minus 4.1 so big difference between the the high and the low and it will be able to distinguish ones and zeros no problem now take a look at a different scenario where the power is i'm sending This is one volt for the one and minus one for the zero and this is my noise again that will be added you see here that the noise may be higher enough that the receiver will not be able to distinguish whether the signal is above zero or below zero. If it mixes, if the signal was sent originally below zero, minus one volt, and the noise is so high that it's measured as 0.1 volt, then the receiver may be, uh, may misinterpret the signal as a positive as one instead of zero and you see it will get worse and worse the 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 lower the voltage is the lower the voltage of the signal the more easy to for the for the noise could to corrupt it and make it look like it's a negative or it's it's a different polarity right different so instead of one it's a zero right so I did this in, in backward, so the solution is, well, make the power higher, right? The higher the power, the less likely for the noise to corrupt it. The lower the power of the signal, the easier for the noise to corrupt it. But power is not cheap. Power, you have to pay for for, for the power. So that's one of the limitations that we have.